Okay, so we 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 uh, we're recording then now, Andre. So uh, you, you've you've got uh, eleven chapters into the book, into my book, closer to God. So, what do you think of the show so far? So far, it's an interesting read, absolutely, because uh, somebody will always find something that resonates with them within that book, you know, and. Uh, uh, I already underlined something in uh, the book uh, just uh, when uh, it uh, reads like about the author when they sh show a pic picture of it. Yeah. So I just underlined uh, after seeing some of what uh, the metaphysical dimension has to offer, he has struggled to find his footing again in a world he no longer recognizes and believes in like uh, he once did. Yeah, uh, that is uh, something that uh, I uh, kind of struggle with too, you know. Uh, and um, I go within the realm of uh, other people uh, sometimes, you know. I haven't really 100% found my way out of it. And sometimes there's... Uh, things within that world that lingers as well you know like uh -huh, okay it is a bit um, interesting you know you you see people you see how they are and so on and so, sometimes you find glimpses w uh, within certain people as well you know ah uh -huh, okay there are potentials and some people might just be like uh, you you believe it to begin with but maybe there was not much you know you know but but there are actually uh, potential and people that are interested in spirituality and so on because i'm pretty observant and so on so if i uh, see a person with a certain tattoo a person act in a certain way i can like uh, start to ask somebody about uh, the roman empire just because i see that he is in a certain way or is if somebody seems to be a little bit autistic okay uh, what I, I could expect him to have a, uh, like a higher iq many times also right uh, so i saw a person uh, just a while back that had a, a tattoo that is a tourist rune which is a kind of uh, the rune of the um, um uh, giants you know Right. The giants was like a very uh, uh, dark, you know, in a way. They were, were uh, like a destructive force, you know, but but uh, there is a part of wisdom in it as well. Yeah, do you mean like the Nephilim giants? Yeah, yeah but, but uh, there was the giants of the like uh, northern uh, um, mythology, you know. Right, yeah. 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 So he had a death rune and... Uh, I recognize certain things about the people. Uh, I saw a girl that had Medusa's head uh, uh, on her arm, and then I think, aha, that's not the girl you want to be with. Uh, she will turn you into stone, you know? Right, so, yeah. There's all that kind of interesting stuff that uh, you see in the material world, but will say something within the certain person and so on. Yeah, and that that's very true and um, very observant because whenever we uh, look at tattoos, uh, we have to consider whether they may be uh, a reflection of the person's inner. Uh, yeah. It isn't always the case because if you look at most people, they just have tattoos which look cool or they think look cool. And so... If they're pretty nondescript tattoos, then you think, well, that's what that sort of person is. But if you've got something like Medusa, or if you've got something like um, mythological or something, then the chances are they know a little bit about that. And they wear it because it is a part of their personality. Now, people have often said to me, oh, do a video about your tattoos. And so I, I have done. And, um, you know, my tattoos are all very important to me because they all mean something uh, about my life and about my character. And um, 
of course i've got you know pirate ships and pirate maps and uh so it's all about adventure and um you know the law um uh, of your own morality really because the pirates had a law uh and they you know had to abide by very very strict laws when they were on the ship and on land together otherwise there would have been mayhem so they they had a lot of respect and a lot of laws um which they had to abide by for each other uh and so when we look at people's handles on like youtube and you know whatever it is whatever it says there's there's a root connection to that to their core and if i'm ever going to have um, any issues with um, anybody about my religious videos then all i've got to do is look for somebody with christ in their name or god or a picture of the crucifix or you know something like that and you go oh here we go here we go and um, that's invariably what happens and if somebody has something like um, um, serpent in their name or um, uh, something derogatory then you know that that's the root of what they are they're going to be derogatory and then as soon as they start putting stuff down well it's exactly what you'd expect from their uh, thumbnail you know from their handle and so it's, it's very valid what you say and so if we are observant like this then we can make a lot of um, assessments uh, by people's yeah. characters in many different ways. Yeah, uh, it, it's, uh, it's like my thumbnails uh, on YouTube. Uh, my name is Mort or something, and that, bit, uh, but that means death, you know? Yeah. Uh, but uh, that would uh, maybe be considered dark. I just took it out of nowhere, but I know that is because I... Have a certain affiliation with death. I'm interested in death and so on. You know, uh, how what's the world beyond this world and so on when you die? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, so so there, there's that part as well. And my previous YouTube uh, uh, had a name uh, Primordial North, and uh, yeah, maybe one could get something from that as well. Yeah. Yeah. Would that be a Viking sort of thing? Yeah, I would say that. Yeah 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 and so obviously um the awakened brave well you know it's self-explanatory um what, what, what i use and so yeah if we um uh, keep very observant and um we we can make uh very acute assessments which uh, will serve as well and um if we don't uh, let on that we've noticed these things but we can just start to um sort of ask questions around like you say then more will be revealed and then uh you can say something to them and they wouldn't be aware that you've noticed their tattoos and they think oh how do you know that about me you know, well, it's because you've got it written all over your body. That's how. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and, you know, if you know something about this stuff yourself, then um, people are going to read it. So if people look at my tattoos and they look like I've got a pirate's map where the treasure is uh, buried and then there's two guns uh, and it says fortune favors the bold, which is uh, Alexander the Great's motto. And then mm -hmm. on this arm, there is um, a, a pirate's uh, old galleon ship um, with a sense of adventure and that, that you know, the camaraderie um, outside of uh, the main paradigm of, of social law, but got their own laws, you know. They've, uh, they, they, they've written the whole, because they, they actually wrote a, a, a pirate's code um, mm -hmm. and, you know, they all had to swear by that when they joined uh, each uh, gang and ship. Um, yeah, and so um, once we uh, have this level of um, insight, then it, it most certainly fares well with us. And so when, um, you know, I, I, I said that in the blurb, you see, that's called a blurb on the back of a book. And uh, you have to write it in a third person. 
third person yeah. perspective so i was speaking about myself as the author and i was saying that the author struggled to find his footing again uh once you know he'd been to hell and back um because he no longer recognizes the world or feels about it like he once did and that's the thing when we have something powerful happen in our lives whether it's um you know a spiritual awakening or a near-death experience or a deeply traumatic experience it shakes our world and then we 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 see it differently don't we yeah absolutely i think uh... Uh, like a friend of mine uh, said that uh, many people hadn't uh, get their stress up in an early age and uh, that's why they are followers because they haven't they got have, their, they hadn't got their stress up yeah yeah they ha haven't uh, got the like um there is I, I mean uh, stress levels up you, you know at an early age uh, through some traumatic experiences and so on yeah right yeah and so when they don't have that when they haven't experienced that what what sort of people do you think they are they they are the ones that uh, work and look at the mainstream me media and so on and they uh, just follow whatever and uh, they d don't really think they just go by impulse so to speak if they feel uh, they get offended is because they have been told to get offended by a certain thing yeah <laughs> uh, being uh, told that they should feel good about that they feel good about that you know so, so they're, they're they're automaton then yeah yeah and to to break out of um our automaton nature uh, we we have to have something that shocks us out of that, and um, then we uh, can no longer be formatted. We can't be programmed. We don't receive the programming. Depending on what agency, um, I had a, a very deep shocking experience when I was four years old, when my mother vacated this uh, dimension, and that turned my world upside down and so i wasn't programmable because i was never in any school long enough for them uh, to um, even begin to program me uh, i would join a school and um, i was always behind because uh, i always joined a school um, at you know ad hoc stages in the year i never joined the school at the beginning of that year you know because i would have to wait too long without schooling so um if i moved from a children's home to another children's home i'd have to go to another school near that and so i would walk into a class where everybody was already friends they were already half or three quarters away away through the curriculum i didn't know what was going on and so i just didn't even bother to try um, mm -hmm. And then have, everybody had me written off as, as a numb school because, um, you know, I, I was always like that. And then after a while, I just thought, fuck it, uh, there's no point in me doing this. Um, but, um, y yeah, the, the you see, I, I couldn't be programmed to learn all that stuff, but I was was wise and i would look and observe and i would listen so i got a different kind of education you know hmm. yeah uh, when i went to school i uh think in fourth grade it became a bit too much for me you know so so uh i was just messing around uh, too much and then i got relegated from the school two weeks into the new school yeah uh, because uh, i i don't really know just because uh, they thought that i was aggressive or violent or something like that you mm -hmm. know uh, which uh, i could be when i was younger but all of a sudden when i came to a new school everybody was complaining about that and even uh, even uh, one woman teacher started to cry uh, because of uh, me being angry at somebody else, you know? Right. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so, yeah, I was in school, but I never did anything, really. 
Yeah. And so you was kind of like a bit of an angry kid because of your uh, bad parenting. You weren't really nurtured that um, well, were you? Uh, little little uh, uh, a bit of a colorful upbringing, one could say. Yeah. I mean, it's uh, so vastly different than uh, many people that it's like... Uh, even when I say a little bit, there it's kind of weird. But I haven't realized that very well until I became an adult. You know mm -hmm. that I, I was uh, often when I was a, a child and a teenager, I was very indifferent as well. You know. Yeah. Yeah. So that's what I found um, by you know having these channels for all these years uh gathering up uh a lot of what society would consider to be oddballs people that um don't fit in and there's so many people on this channel which uh don't have any friends they don't have any social life they don't want it it's too much bullshit they're not needy at all they're perfectly comfortable with themselves and maybe a dog or some cats or something like this and yeah you know i quickly did that you know i quickly looked at the world and uh, i saw what a shit fest it was and decided that um i was my own best company <laughs> yeah <laughs> Oh, my God. Uh, but although, you know, I have had um, friends, I I've never had a lot of friends. I've always had close friends, but few, because I demanded a lot from my friends. And yeah, I one, demand a lot as well. Yeah. yeah. And when you demand a lot, there's not too many that want to live up to that. And so that's cool because it, it, it really, um, you know, it, it 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 sifts out all the um, the idiots and the the flaky varieties, and basically you just end up with solid people, and um, yeah. so that was my intention, and so the, yeah, it, it's all worked worked out, and uh, my friends always used to say to me, uh, I was always difficult to really get close to, and. Um, they always used to maintain that um, I had a policy whereby uh, I would always want to meet people halfway. Uh, it's kind of like if you've got a, a kitty, you know, which you, you're paying into, uh, everybody pays the same, you know. And if you discover somebody's only paying a few pounds a week when you should be putting in 20 then someone's freeloading yeah so i would never stand for any freeloaders and i always wanted everybody to meet me um with as much energy as i put into a relationship you know and i always was like, like quite vigorous you know in let's do this and let's do that and, uh, you know, always trying to inspire people into doing stuff and pushing ourselves, um, you know, be beyond lots of parameters. And, um, yeah, yeah pe pe people, you know, used to find that very challenging, yeah. but rewarding, that they're, yeah. uh, they're the same, you know. Yeah, uh, I, I like that too, and I still like that, you know. With the, the friends I have, we, we all train. We all uh, demand a little bit of martial art into it as well, you know. Yeah. And, uh, we we all go to the gym. We all, uh, um, um, yeah. We don't eat shit, you, you know. And uh, we uh, we we see how we can so solve certain things in our lives as well, you know. Instead of just going with it and say. Yeah, I'm fat. I have a, my back is hurting and so on. Yeah, but uh, you can probably do something about it. You know. And yes, uh, and, and and so um, you attract people that uh, are going to do something about it, and you're not going to suffer anybody that doesn't. Uh, you're not going to have these fat friends and all these sort of things, really. So I'm just um, flicking through um, the book. And yeah. I'm looking um, towards uh, chapter 11, where you are now. Yeah. Uh, and I just want to 
okay so i've just opened it at chapter 11 so chapter 11 starts on my astral uh, adventures so you you've not um, come to that part yet but i'm going to go back now and see what you have come to because i just want to ask you just very briefly what you made of each chapter yep and so I'm going back now to chapter 10. And OK, right. This is the, this is one which I've always um, been in a conundrum over. What's love got to do with it? Yeah, that, that, that is a thing that you have uh, uh, talked about a lot in the past. And yeah. Uh, yeah, that, that is a um, hard uh, thing to get oneself around uh, the, the topic of love and also uh, eros like erotic love and so on is also a hard nut to crack you know because yeah all different like varieties of love what, what do people mean when they say love and uh, how yeah. do we feel love how do we give love and how do we quantify people when they say that they love us but you don't recognize love there you go what sort of love is that that looks more like bullshit to me what do you mean by love so i've always um been quantifying people and so um what 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 if anything did you relate to in that chapter because that chapter is 30 pages long and um yeah. it's, it's quite a lengthy chapter let's see mm -hmm. so i mean just just the subheadings here yeah. uh what's love got to do with it uh basically it's kind of like um what is love you know what's good what's love got to do with anything how do we define it what do we mean by it another um well one yeah. of the sub chapters is there must have been something that i was missing um i i couldn't grok what people were talking about they all seemed to have this idea that they shared uh, a very similar notion of what love was and i just didn't because love was so fragmented there was so many varieties of this love love for grandmother love for chocolate love for your wife love for your children what are you talking about when you speak about love you know yeah it's like in the greek language there's more than one word to love uh, and uh, also i think also when uh, people talk about the human connection and human love and so on you know it is uh, like an ephemeral thing it's like uh, i love you now i love you like when a woman say i love you it just means if you put the other other word there as well you know I love you now. You're satisfying me now. Yeah, but but that that will change from day to day. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that will change from day to day. Uh, why are there these profound differences in love? So, well, I mean, ask the question yourself. I mean, how were you loved from your father? from your mother from your brothers and sisters uh from your girlfriends D didn't you look at that and you go what the fuck is this love it just you know it it, 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 yeah. it, it, it shouldn't we shouldn't assume that this love uh is something that we all know the meaning of we don't not a single person on the planet i'm telling you now uh, has got the same opinion of love and we don't know what it is we most certainly don't know what it is yeah, there, there was a girlfriend that told me that she loved me. <laughs> and then I, I told her, I also like you very much. Ah. <laughs> yeah. Because uh, it really just means I like you very much. Now, like you said. Yeah, now. Yeah. Because, um, because uh, also a woman's love is like ephemeral, uh, more ephemeral than a man, man, I think, in a way. It's like flighty. She, she changing her emotion from time to time. Yeah, I mean, very flighty. And um, it's, uh, so 
I, I've, I've got one of the subheadings. Are deities, in effect, globally imagined spiritual manifestations or egregores? Now, that's probably a bit too deep um, for us to, to delve into right now. But... Um, what page? Yeah, okay. Uh, one, 133. Our deities, uh, deities, uh, in effect, globally imagined spiritual manifestations or egregores. Yeah, you also re re wrote about egregores on yeah. page 136. And there, there was written, egregores are uh, egos that uh, form in the inner level of the mind. Uh, whenever a group of like-minded people come together for a common cause the the egregores are constructed they are constructs of the thought forms that contain all the information symbols affirmations emotions actions memories and the para 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 man, paramanent understanding of those who have assessed the group through the thought form before that that's an interesting thing as well because uh, that that is uh, what uh, comes into christianity comes into all religions and so on and uh, also when having a group you know um you know like i have a group uh or we we uh, from time to time call it a tribe you know uh, and uh, it's uh, much like uh, order as well, you know, uh, like uh, like the Freemasonic order w would be, you know, we yeah. act in a similar spirit, uh, you know, but uh, but with uh, different rule sets, you know. Yeah. So uh, one of the other subheadings is when love doesn't live up to our expectations. Another one is still searching for the ever elusive love. Uh, another one is, is real love a chemical which can be found in a psychedelic? So there's lots of questions that I'm asking about love. Mm -hmm. And what I'm doing is uh, in this whole book, I am looking at what is generally accepted to be something in this world. And I'm showing the reader that in actual fact, there isn't anything that really is something. There is only a conglomerate of ideas projected onto something which create a, 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 a fictitious manifestation like an ego goal. So typically people do this to Jesus. They focus so much about their fantasy of love onto this fiction that it's become like he's real. And many people will want to kill you if you say anything about him. You know, it's kind of like, well, they've, they've, they've created this fiction, but which is more real than you now, more real than me, more real than them. You know, look at what their imagination has done. And if you said to them, well, look, this guy, he lived 2,000 years ago, apparently, and then he went back into the ether. So he isn't real in that sense at all. And he doesn't warrant anybody killing anybody uh, just because somebody's been blaspheming against him. So wh what are you doing? What have you created? You've created hate, deep, deep root sickness and hate out of a fiction of your own mind. Because yeah. even if this thing is real, it's all beautiful. Well, it can't be touched then by stupid words. So why would you want to kill somebody that's saying words about this thing? None of it makes any sense. Mm. Human being is very, very stupid. Yeah. So when, when we look at love and we, we ask people, okay, tell me about love. What is love? And they go, oh, well, you know, it's when you feel in a certain way. And, and I'd go, well, yeah. What, like you say you love your dog? Yeah, I love my dog. Oh, I love my dog. Well, what about your children? Ah, oh, well, that's different, love. How different? Well, it's kind of like one's dog love and one's children love. Well, how does it differ? Ooh, I don't know. Because I really do love them both. But there is a difference. And it's kind of like, well... 
I mean, would you die for one of them? Would you die for your children or would you die for your dog? And most people will probably say, mm, I wouldn't die for my dog, but I'd die for my children. Well, OK, then. I like that bit of it because there's a definition. There's a, there's a difference between the two varieties of love. OK, so let's investigate that further then. So you die for one, but you wouldn't die for the other. So one has more value than your life and the other one doesn't have more value than your life. Your life is more valuable than your dog, uh, but it's not more valuable than your young child. Oh, that's interesting. Why is that then? Why do we think that our young children have more value than us being older? And then we get into metaphysics whereby, well, we've already lived lots of years and bless their little cotton socks. They've not experienced what we have. So therefore, I would die to give them the opportunity to have at least what I have had. So when you start breaking down what love is, it turns into a very, very bizarre thing. And we get really into the depths of, of metaphysics um, and, you know, existentialism and everything like that. The, the realms where people are just not prepared or equipped to go. Yeah. And also, uh, here's another thing that you write about love here on the page 122. Uh, and I think you talk about the dark night of the souls here. It is best to live a life devoid of love for fear of an equal amount of suffering being the depth ultimately demanded by the universe yeah payback yeah so what do you think about that yeah it's almost painful fault to read it you know <laughs> you, you see you know what 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 I'm saying here is, yeah. and it, it's what you know. Some other philosophers have said in the past. Yeah, and you just read it. Tis best to live a life devoid of love, for fear of an equal amount of suffering being the debt ultimately demanded by the universe, because the universe is like a checking account, and it's going to keep balance it's going to keep the books balanced and so if you've had love 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 and your life's been a bed of roses it ain't gonna last forever you better watch out buddy because shit's coming down on you because that's how the universe works and then if we have love then someone's gonna die Someone's going to get sick, someone's going to leave the other, and then you're going to have an equal amount of suffering as a result of that through the loss. Yeah. The, 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 then I start to think about the book I also read besides your book, you know? Yeah. Julius Evola. Okay, Eros. Yeah. Erotic love and so on, you know? It says here, there is no love so secure that it does not need an always, an endless duration. There's always a love that's not so secure that what? There is no love so secure that it does not need an always, an, an endless duration. So prior to that, he said, Will you love me forever? Will you ever tire of me? Will you always want me? There is no love so secure that it does not need an always, an endless duration. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's always uh, this one thing to preserve this moment here, now, forever. But yeah. it doesn't work that way. I've only recently started to, uh, to get involved with Evola. Uh, but everything he said so far, it's as if I could have written it. It comes from my um, philosophy, from my heart and everything. I'm, I'm just in 100% agreement. You know, it's not very often that that happens, um, you know, uh, with philosophers or spiritualists. But uh, when it does, it's kind of like, wow, that's kind of bizarre, that is. And, you know, Evelot is renowned for being a radical and, a, and you know, uh, bordering on a fascist, uh, at least having uh, a fascist sympathies, you know. Um, 
but yeah, I mean, I, I've still got three of his books on my shelf that I've got to get through now. Um, so you see, what I'm asking uh, viewers is, Andre, um, this book has to fucking mean something. It has to fucking mean something. And if we can't contemplate each individual chapter for a whole fucking week, we haven't read it. Either mm -hmm. that or we haven't lived. Because what I'm doing is I, I'm questioning uh, these things like what is faith, what is belief, what is love, what is hate, what is heaven, what is hell, what is fucking religion, what is the Garden of Eden, uh, what, 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 and, and I'm assessing it and I'm evaluating it and I'm writing down what my experience has been with all of these things. And so what the, the job for the reader, in my estimation, uh, is that they will read it from their perspective and they will yeah. ask themselves, what the fuck do I think? What the fuck do I know? What the fuck is my opinion on that? You know, this book it, it is psychology, it's philosophy, it's metaphysics, it, it's spirituality, it's every fucking thing. Uh, if people open their minds up uh, just, just to look into it, um, you know, it, Marcus Aurelius' his fucking uh, meditations. He, 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 you know, I don't know. It, it's, um... <clears throat> you know, you know, people will read a, a, a book uh, at a certain point in their life that uh, certain things will also resonate with them in. And... Uh, I would say this book is easily readable for m most people. Uh, some people might think certain words are a little hard to get around and so on or something like that, but it's a, a pretty easy read. Uh, and you, as a, if you, you can relate to certain things within the pages of this book, yes, you can also develop from that as well. Because I, I know uh, from you that you have gone a certain path of bravery and also endure pain and uh, suffering and so on, you know. So, uh, th that way is the name of the game. Uh, for, for the most part, um, it's not sitting at home with the mobile phone in hand, looking into a screen all day, masturbating at pornography or as, uh, other uh, useless stuff like eating a lot of trash and so on. And to say, well, I, at least I go for a little walk and uh, because I have uh, gone for a walk today, I deserve an ice cream. Yeah. It's not like that. <laughs> I deserve an ice cream. <laughs> yeah, um, th th there's so much more to life and, and, and that's the thing. Um, in chapter nine, uh, it starts off the day Jehovah kicked my ass. Now, this is about um, a high dose of uh, mushrooms, and um, it's a, an ideal opportunity for many people to have a look at what is actually said here. For yeah. any people who have taken these mushrooms to see if yeah. uh, they can relate to something that I'm speaking about, any people that have contemplated religion, um, what's the nature of God, how does God manifest, how the folk does God manifest in a mushroom trip? You know, how does that work? Well, I talk about that. I open it up. I analyze it. I question it. And, um, you know, there's, there's, there's certain revelations uh, within that. Um, yeah. You certainly experience a lot through uh, the antigens. Yeah. And the mushrooms and all that kind of stuff. Um, I have myself done it very little. Uh, the last year I did, uh, only in February last year I did something. This year I only did it once and it was only a 0 0.6, you know, uh, just to, 
I want to approach it from a different perspective this time if I do it, you know, but I haven't felt like uh, doing it. I have so much from all the other uh, trips I have had in the past to integrate and look at before doing it yeah. too much again, you know. Yeah. And, uh, um, go on. And uh, you read, uh, wrote here on page uh, um, 120 and 20 the word enthusiasm comes from the greek word enthus which means the god within and the happiest most interesting people are those who have found the secret of maintaining their enthusiasm that god within yes and uh, that is uh, related to the antigen as well, because there there comes this uh, enthusiastic part where you get all this excited and stuff. Yeah. Well, entheogen, enthusiasm, like yeah. you just read out, exactly. it's the same root word which derives from Greece. And when we are enthusiastic, uh, it means that we actually have God within us. And we ask ourselves, well, why is that then? Why is God within me if I'm enthusiastic about something? I could be enthusiastic about beating off over porn. Is God in me then? What actually is it? Well, if I'm excited, if I'm living, if I'm present, then God is with me. Wow. Okay. So every time I become enthusiastic, uh, I am experiencing God consciousness because I am present, I am living, and I'm doing everything in his world that he wanted us to do. Perfect. Mm. Wonderful. Hmm. Hmm. Uh, I think about the death. It, uh, because Evola is always pointing upward, you know? pointing upward there there is a way upward that is more yeah yeah exactly what your title uh, are, are written like closer to god yeah there's a hierarchy that is directed up, upward and when it goes downward it is to the feminine aspect and the right. material world and so on uh -huh. and the matter is mother it's uh the yeah. maternal aspect and when a society starts to degenerate it becomes more into the matter and it gets more split in all uh, facets of different uh, kinds right gets fragmented yeah and uh yeah I, I, maybe i deviate a little bit uh, but but uh, i i uh, if you just look at the uh, the masculine and feminine aspect in society, you see that everything be actually is uh, uh, like directed towards the feminine aspect uh, nowadays. Even at the gym, it's fancy pants, you know? There's always a place for women to work out and uh, so on, but God forbid if uh, only men w want to work out at a certain place, you know? Yeah. And, uh, and men often go with their head down and they, they, um, they, they um, don't, they, they, they are, they often push down without knowing it. Uh, and they're getting weaker because of that and so on. Yeah. Yeah. They're all being browbeaten. And yeah, um, yeah the, the men are becoming less manly um, mm. and the women are becoming more manly. And so, you know, just like politics, everything's becoming inverted. Um, yeah, you know, it, it's a good sign because it just shows that, you know, we're tired of how it is. So we really want a, a change, but we don't quite know what change we want. So we're trying everything. I know, let's all women try to be men let's all men just be fem feminine and we women and weak and subservient and let's see if that fucker works i know let's invert politics once upon a time this party meant that and that party meant the other but now let's just change it around we'll keep the same names only we'll adopt the uh, the, the opposite policies that's what's happening and you, you look at the world and you just go well that's 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 a seriously destabilized psyche 
Yeah, and uh, wherever uh, uh, women come into the place, it becomes like more feminized as well, you know, because let the women be in the masculine sector, then and the masculine sector uh, starts to feminize, you know. Yeah. And uh, uh, the women go around, show their body everywhere, and enticing desire in the man, you know. Right. And uh, that that is also something I, I think I try, always try to aesthetically withstand the even the, the desire to uh, be enticed by that, you know, because I don't think it has a place in the gym really. The, they can have their own gym. Yeah, <laughs> they can have their own gym. <laughs> well, I'm old enough, young enough uh, to remember um the days when uh, gyms were spit and sawdust uh, they were all free weights and there weren't no machines uh, there weren't even running machines you know when i started let's say um 50 or 45 years ago um and so yeah the, the way you'd work out would be weights and then to get a little bit feminine so women could do a bit then the dumbbells, instead of being this big, started to get smaller and smaller and smaller till you got little piddly things like this, which men could lift up with their penises. Um, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> then women start to to come in and then they start to introduce more machines to keep it uh, friendly. And then they take away the man's weights away. And all we've got left these days is a bunch of girls' machines. Um but the, the saving grace for these girls' machines is that they've become more scientific and they do actually have a lot of weight on them. So girls yeah. can mess around with one little plate, but there are like another 50 for, for a man to, to get hold of it. And, um, you know, then we look at women and like it's like they're, they're at a fashion show when they're in the gym, you know, like you say, with the makeup, the hair and, and, and all the gear on. It's kind of like, well... You know, why don't you just come in in, in your rags? Just come in some old T-shirt and an old pair of, um, you know, uh, tracksuit bottoms and just do your workout. Um, or it seems to me that you're too, you know, conscious about who's looking at my ass. Do you want everyone to look at your ass? And all this sort of thing, like, like, like you say, yeah. Um, and, of course, now in these days in gyms, you've got 90-year-olds working out next to you. Um, and this never used to happen, you know. It just didn't happen. Uh, but but now, you, you know, and the kids, of course. You, there was a time when you had to be sixteen to get in a gym, uh, use weights in in Britain. Now it's like you know, twelve year olds are, are allowed in. And wow. Yeah, you say you got twelve years old, and then you got like eighty years old uh, fucking around on on something. Um, mm. Yeah, so 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 bizarre. But anyway, we we, we digressed. Let's get yeah, back to the real meat. I, also, I digressed a bit. You know, how can we know if God is within us? What do you think about that, Andre? I I I don't know too much. You know. Uh, I you don't really know too much know. about God, or you don't know too much. Period. <laughs> yeah, it's like, yeah, whatever. Uh, I'm at, I'm at. You know, you're at. If uh, if I have like a kind of intuition towards it, then I could assume that that is God. You know. Yeah. But, but I'm always. Um, I'm always, um, let's say, suspicious. And I'm suspicious of myself. I'm a, a suspicious of others. I'm suspicious of very much, you know? So if I, I think something is something, I'm suspicious of uh, that being something, you know? Right. So that, that's the problem. <laughs> Suspicious of something being something. Yeah. So what are your reflections then on God 
or is it just something that you just never really been interested in? You never really yeah, thought. Yeah, I'm about? very interested in God, but but I always want to put it in like a structure, you know. Yeah. I want to put it in like a, a idealistic hierarchy, you know. Like I think about the Roman Empire, uh, the beginning of the Roman Empire, when the rulers were like gods within the Roman Empire. Yeah, because I would assume that they were so close to God back then that we couldn't even imagine. So those men were something we haven't seen today. So we couldn't. Uh, may maybe we could imagine a little bit, but um, uh, and that is kind of what I think of godliness. Because I like the warrior aspect as well, you know. So the, the, the both the contemplative and the uh, heroic action uh, is like something I uh, find very um, appealing. So you you're very much like um, Julian. You know the 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 conversation I had with Julian. You commented yeah. on that, so you listened to at least a bit of one of them. Um, I think he, I listened an hour in, and I uh, I will listen to rest as well because I really liked it. It was great. Yeah, but because he he's you know very into Evola. He's very yeah. into um, you know the Nordic mythology with um, you know the. Um, um, the ancient uh, gods, um, like you say, um, it, it, it's it's funny, you know. You 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 should say that because you say in the old days, uh, these kings they they were kind of like they were gods. Well, I, I think probably they were, and when we look into like the Anunnaki. Uh, origins of the human being, the Homo sapiens, supposedly being spliced out of Neanderthal by the Anunnaki with a little bit of their uh, DNA and a little bit of um, uh, Neanderthal DNA created the human being. So originally then uh, the, the human beings would have been put into place in a hierarchical system. They would have been chosen uh, for their attributes and their power and they would would have been given the right by gods and now this is why all over the world uh, the hierarchical systems have maintained that they have received their position of kingship uh, via divinity they've always maintained that they have been divinely given those positions yeah you know that yeah Yes, like the royal family, you know, is passed down uh, because mm -hmm. uh, God gave their ancestors uh, that position. So there's something in it. That's what I'm saying. And the, the leaders, when Evola speaks about uh, kings and, and, you know, mythological figures and everything, these kings are very, very powerful, very, very clever, uh, very divine. Uh, they, they earned their fucking position, you know, through them being smart, through them sh shedding blood, their own and others. And, you know, the, 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 their position, uh, even if it was originally gifted, it was earned to, to maintain it. Yeah, because they had a close affinity with truth and i i know that um, truth people are saying i know the truth i knew know the truth is like yeah it's preposterous sometimes you know but they uh, had let's say a great affinity with honesty you know mm -hmm. as they perceive honesty the world. integrity like you say, whatever yeah. truth was at that time, whatever they deemed it to be, they'd stand by it and die yeah. for it. Yeah. And that is why I think back in the days, things were more right than truthful, you know? More right than truthful. Yeah, it, it, right and truthful. Right and right, truthful. You know? yeah. it, it was... Uh, 
more truthful in every aspect, you know, because we are all, always falling, 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 falling. You yeah. Know, you know, in the, the moder modernity, the Kali Yuga, so to speak. Yeah. Yeah, so so that's really interesting because uh, I I I listened to the, uh, the 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 audio book of um, uh, Ed Vola's um, um, uh, Divine Rights. Let me just see what this book was called. The Revolt Against the Modern World. Yes. Yes. Yeah, I have have uh, it here as well. Yeah. Right. Here. Yeah. And uh, yeah, then I have this one. I think Julian said to you to read this one as well. Yes, yeah, yeah, definitely. I'm I'm gonna get round to them. And you see, um, I've listened to the uh, the audio of um, the revolt, but I've got to read that book again because, um, like all great books, you just got to keep reading and meditating on this stuff. And, and yeah. when, when you do that, then you become more and more enlightened and uh, endowed with the, the very essence and spirit of what was being conveyed then. You can't just read this shit and, and, and just think, you know, it, it doesn't work like that. No, it, it, it works over time, you know. You read the book, you may maybe get something into your mind. Uh, a couple of months later, something else pops down. Aha, that was what he actually said. But uh, you, you maybe didn't reflect that much on that certain part of it that time, you know? Yeah. Uh, so, so it's a process. Even when you stopped reading a chapter and you go uh, about your daily life, that's when the subconscious mind is uh, like uh, putting the pieces together as well, you know. Yeah. So where are you um, uh, in relation to uh, God? Uh, do you consider that God made the universe, God made the earth, uh, the Demiurge made the, 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 the mankind or the Anunnaki made mankind um, or God's uh, consciousness? or what, what, What's your uh, philosophy um, on that? Either we was uh, close, closer to God or we were God, you know. We, right. were, we, we came from that source. Yeah. So uh, that's uh, about my my view upon it. I also find Meister Eckhart's uh, view on it very appealing. Right. Because that was a, much like Buddhism in a way, um, that man was God and was becoming God, a yeah. Gnostic view on it, you know? Yeah, yeah. I, I think um, there's, a, there's a lot to be said for that. And I think, you know, that man has certainly fallen from dizzier heights. Yeah. And... Um, if we ask ourselves, well, how could we have been God? Uh, it, it can't be as a physical thing. It has to be of something that we all share because then we all share in it. So therefore, then let's say spirit is God. Let's say consciousness is God. So in the initial humble beginnings of mankind, when we first had consciousness and self-awareness we realized our power and we realized our divinity and we asked the question where did this come from how is it that we can know things and question the cosmos and this and the other we must be god if there were no bibles and if there were no Qurans and all this stuff when people started to contemplate this and observe the stars and the things we did well i mean it seems the obvious um uh, port of call uh, to consider that you know we are uh, the, the the highest in in the evolution on the planet um and and so you know if we consider ourselves um if we self-impose our own godliness upon us because otherwise if we don't self-impose our own godliness upon us then we're going to be looking for something who created us aren't we and yeah. uh, Ultimately, that looks like what we've done and we've invented all these different sorts of stuff. But 
going back before we invented all these books, I wonder how we thought about ourselves. Yeah, because then it would be, if we think about that, that would begin at we being God. We just the people of godliness. Yeah. And uh, later on, we were split into two. So uh, the uh, feminine part and the masculine part got separated. So um, would it then be that we were a race of her hermaphrodites or something like that in the beginning? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So that's, I mean, of course, that's endlessly complex. I um, talked about there have uh, existed a, a race of uh, hermaphrodites. Hermaphrodites, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, there's, there's one book, it's called oh, um, um, A Chemeral Mind. Um, it's by Julian Haynes. The bicameral mind, and, and, and this guy reckons that um, when our consciousness first came online, uh, man must have thought it was God speaking to them. Because yeah. if we had the brain of a primate, which never had a, a state of consciousness which could self-reflect, uh, then we would just go about our business and we wouldn't ever think about who we are or where we came from but when that that ability to self-reflect came about when it tentatively started to you know you hear voices in your head who am i you know shall i go and do this who you know you, you you're toying in your mind about making decisions you never did this as a primate you know you mm -hmm. just did it Whatever you felt like, whatever you was driven by, by your instincts, you just did it. But then all of a sudden, when we start to have this bicameral mind, we start to, to question, hmm, should I do that? Should I do it now or should I do it later? Or should I not do it at all? Maybe it's too dangerous. You've got all this shit. Who, who's responsible for that? Who was, who was saying that originally, you know? Um, so yeah it's just just massively too complex um for, for anyone to get their heads around but by yeah. the time we've read all this stuff then we've got at least we've got an idea of what other people's opinions were you know and ideas and uh, then we we you know do our best to to form our own but you see what i've done in this book i've formed my own opinions on my own experience and then i've maybe compared it with what other people have said but um Everything I've put in this book is my experience, how I've experienced the world and what I am. And that's the only thing I could even have any you know, semblance of allegiance to in relation to it being true, you know. Yeah. It, as you said in, uh, let's say, um, page 125, if we cannot adequately define something and nail it down as something concrete how can we be sure of its existence why do we put so much emphasis on con concepts that we can't even come close to defining the idea of god is a prime example and uh, yeah uh, like your book is a, 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 a mouthpiece uh, for you to explain all or everything that you've gone through and so on and also you you get get to that uh, uh i think you have said something like uh, this also shows like that somebody else also could uh, write the book you know uh, uh, I I have had the thought when you said that, you know, because uh, I have gathered a lot of the urinals about myself since 2010. Right. And I lost a little bit of it. So I could probably put that together in one way. Yeah, I, I think um, what makes um, a book interesting is if you... Uh, always have um, different opinions to to 
and perspectives to look at something. You see, if if we uh, read religious uh, dogma, then there is just an opinion. Uh, it's not even an opinion. It's supposed to be gospel. You know, that's why it's called gospel. And that's just the way it is. And nobody's supposed to question it. And nobody did question it. It, it was just stated as if it is. Well, it's just one-sided. It's out of balance. And there's nothing in there that, that brings any level of uh, reasonableness to it. We've got to bring reason into our works. Um, and this is the whole nature of philosophy, um, because that's what we do is thinking people. Uh, thinking people don't uh, write dogma unless they've got an ulterior motive, you know. Um, and if that Bible was the word of God, then... I would have thought he wasn't a very smart one because if he was even just a little bit smart, he would have explained the way he thought or felt along the way instead of just doing shit and saying shit. You know, yeah. that's why nobody's got a, a freaking clue what is supposed to be meant about it. The, many things is so abstract in a way. They, they, uh, chatter about whether god is free and uh, in one and so on you know that could be understood from a symbolical perspective but, but also that yeah the, the offer need to be made by a human being is also what the uh, the orthodox uh, says uh, that's why jesus needed to come down because the sacrifice uh, for the a sinning people must be a human being you know but yeah. the, it was also th this trinity things ha have existed in many different cultures beforehand also and uh, paulus he he um, he didn't even meet jesus and he have a, a thing or two to uh, say about jesus all of a sudden you know mm -hmm. so it's uh, I I am very distrustful of it. At the same time, I have a certain liking towards like the Orthodox Christianity because of the masculine traits within it and the beauty within it, you know. But at the same time, I like everything. Uh, I, the, the the closest of uh, a realistic view is like. Uh, maybe Buddhism or Stoicism, mm -hmm. because, uh, because that even tried to transcend the God, you know? Yeah. So in chapter 8, uh, I talk about meditation and the mystical bliss of a still mind. Yeah. Uh, there, there you had gone through very much meditation you you meditate a lot every day for like a bunch of years yeah and uh, that that's an amount that i do not have done you know mm. and it's a it's a lot of meditation you're gone through i've got gone through a lot of meditation but i am at like sometimes meditation doesn't work with me sometimes i have uh, inner things i need to handle and uh, the meditation doesn't work like it used to sometimes you know mm. you can't get into that space no um and at certain points i i i needed a lot of lot of uh, like i i i would say uh, getting into a meditation group would be a, a good thing to uh, get into the right space because I can nowadays not get into the right space that often. If I cold bathe, I can do it, you know. Hmm. I stay in uh, very cold water for about, uh, yeah, last time I was like 10 minutes in 8 uh, um, degrees Celsius hmm. and so on. Uh, then I, my mind becomes very still and meditative. And at certain points around people, I can get very uh, meditative as well, you know. Mm. Uh, and, and I think uh, there is something to that while 
uh, lately I thought about maybe I meant to be around people, you know, for a while. Right. Uh, because um, there's a disconnect. Uh, because I live in a, I, I have people around me, but it is uh, really good people. Uh, we create things. Uh, it becomes like, in a one way, it becomes like an echo chamber as well, you know. But we learn a lot from each other. But it's uh, of value to go into the world and learning as well, you know. And mm -hmm. I have recognized that I can get into a meditative states around around people uh, nowadays more easily than with myself. Uh, certain uh, sometimes even. Right. So you feel very calm around people, then do you? Yeah, often I can feel very calm around people. Um, I can just observe, you know. Mm. Right. Um, yeah. So that, that, that was what I thought about when you um, talked about um, the, the, the ninth chapter on meditation and so on. You see, the, 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 the meditation um, is... It's so important um, if anyone is going to know God um, that all of those who do know God have meditated for a long time. Yeah. Now, the Buddhists, uh, their whole philosophy is about meditation because meditation will tell you the truth. What is the truth? It's all Maya. And there's nothing in existence except awareness. That's the ultimate truth. And out of that awareness makes manifest all things. So they're not religious. They are spiritual. And initially, the Buddha never uh, considered or, or, or spoke about any afterlife at all. Anything that speaks about the afterlife now is additions that the Buddha never spoke about. Um, yeah. But when we look into um, even uh, Jewish Kabbalah, um, even the, uh, the Orthodox Jews that consider that the only books worthwhile are the first five books of the Bible, which are the Torah, reputedly written by Moses, but very heavily speculated not to have been written by him or even one person. But what they say at the, at the core and the root of their belief is that they will only know God. They can only know God via meditation. Now, most people don't expect this to be so, but you have to get into the depths of these people's minds before you're going to be privy to that because it's very esoteric and it's not something that they sing and dance about. But when you go into Kabbalah, which is a, a, a deeper expression uh, of the mysticism of the first five books of the Bible, Kabbalah discusses the mysticism of all those things. Well, these mystics, um, at the core of, of their religion was meditation. And every one of them states that they can only know God via their meditation. So what is that saying? It, it's saying, ultimately, that they are God. And when they become absolutely silent and still outside of their ego, then they enter into the kingdom of God. Because there's nowhere else for them to go. There is nowhere for the human being to go we're always going to be confined in awareness. Yeah. Awareness has to be God. It's uh, similar to Gnosticism, you know? Yeah. Uh, and uh, that's where a lot where Kabbalah came from as well, you know? Yeah. Because it developed after Christ, 300 years after Christ, right? Yeah. I think. So... Uh, Gnosticism, like uh, Gnostics like um, Meister Eckhart and so on, uh, were also similar to that. Yeah, yeah so um, this is something that um, modern-day Christians um, can't get their head around. And in recent times, I've been, you know, reading the... Um, 
uh, the the second coming of Christ, and I've been speaking about um, Paramahansa Yogananda, stating that y- you you can't you just can't know God unless you meditate, and but the, you see the modern day philosophy um, or dogma or, or whatever you want to call it it's not it's not even a philosophy uh, it's all about prayer and faith well prayer and faith uh, are empty it's it's uh, self hypnosis and you can kid yourself that you will know god or you're going to god you can pretend for as long as you like but unless you meditate and actually know the essence of god then you ain't going nowhere mm-hmm. and you, that's what i'm speaking about um, in this book it's too deep it's too profound for the vast majority of people um because they've got no awareness of all these varying facets of spirituality and gnosticism and deep inner work. And um, I would just expect 99% of everybody just to read through these chapters and not see what I've written. Um, And that's why I I want to have these conversations with people because I, I want to point out the depth of what I'm saying here and how there is only really one way to know yourself, which is God. And that's via the depth of your meditation, because everything else is going to pertain to the ego. Yeah. And all knowledge is pertaining to the ego and all the knowledge that you're going to be reading isn't going to be uh, derived from your own experience. Yeah, the the ego is uh, in uh, in uh, strict relation to the bodily cravings as well. Yeah, it's a fiction. It's it's just a pure fiction. Yeah, and the, and the the crave uh, the, the the ego and the craving uh, could be say, uh, said to be related, right? Very very much because they it's the animal nature. Well, you, yeah, you see, the Buddhists, they say it's all Maya, you know, yeah. it, it, it's all just, just a fiction, it's just a fiction. And all the things that we think are so real about the body, well, I mean, what what's happening? You, you've got certain feelings going on. You've got a certain corporality to um, a body that we consider on one uh, level of cognition is a real thing. But then we can't find the constituents of it um, be, below a certain level. The consti- can you imagine? This is this is what's perplexing. Um, you know, thinking people, philosophers, and scientists. You know, forever when we are so convinced that we've got something real here, we can't find the constituents of that reality. There is no physical matter. Mm. There is just energy. And so then when we seriously look at things, um, we go, well, look, what else is just energy? A hologram is just energy. A simulation is just energy. A computer is just energy. It's, it's programs written in binary, which are, you know, your constituents of the whole cosmos, effectively. That's what the whole cosmos is supposed to be um, created out of. But it's only a program. There's no reality to it there. It's just that 0001 means this. 00111 means that. And then we build a reality on that. And, Mm -hmm. you know, we can do that in our fiction. That's what scientists do. They put all these molecules and so-called atoms together. But, you know, then the quantum physicists will say, well, we can't find any of these atoms and molecules that they're playing with. So what's going on? And that's the thing, you know, this, this life is a very, very perplexing, um, beautiful dream. And so when we go back... You it's know, very, uh, very interesting, yeah? Yeah, it's, it's, in, it's, 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 it's just uh, immensely it's brilliant. It's amazing. But when we go back to people that... Um, had a lot of time on their hands, um, you know, monks and um, p- 
people of that nature who didn't have to labor 12 hours a day just to feed themselves, you, you know, they could give all this stuff contemplation and they pushed all barriers. They boldly went where no other man was ever going. And when you go into the depths of consciousness, you encounter very, very bizarre things. You encounter all different sorts of spirits and energies and you know, angels and demons and, and all the rest of it. It is full. It, it's actually full of all this stuff. Yeah. And that's all in the mind of God. Yeah. And the, in that chapter, uh, you... You came into bliss uh, state when you had uh, meditated for a long time, and it was like a vacuum at a certain point. Yeah. Yeah. Where you, in the beginning, you thought that that was boring, but all of a sudden you start to like it very much and start to continue doing it, right? Yes, because um, my expectations. Given on all of the information that I had learnt and listened to, it was all second-hand, third-hand, fourth-hand, fifth-hand bullshit. And everybody just been passing down this notion of bliss, of this wonderful feeling that you get. But when I entered it, there was just absolutely nothing. It was like... A massive void whereby it kind of like when I was thinking to myself, talking to myself in my mind, I could I could hear my voice flying out in every other dimension for, forever. That's how vast it was. It was just vast. And I stayed there for about 10 minutes and I was expecting something to manifest nothing manifest i was expecting to feel something i didn't feel anything but then what i realized was that when people have interpreted this place as bliss it's not actually bliss that you experience what you experience is the respite from humanisms and so you could say, it, it, by way of explanation, when you detach yourself from being a heinous human being with all the trauma and pain and suffering, oh, 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 thank God for that, it's bliss. No, it's not bliss. It's just nothing. But we, we label it as being bliss because it's got to be something because it does feel like something. It feels like everything, but it's an actual fact, nothing. It's just a complete detachment from human life, from human consciousness, from everything. Mm -hmm. And from out of that, then, it's like you're in the realm of the Akasha, where everything is available to you. And once you have that open state of consciousness, then your 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 consciousness just taps in to the, the entire knowledge of the cosmos and that's why these gurus speak about enlightenment and then um you know if you've got religious people um then they would say well that's god because that's what everything is created out of you know, so again, very, very deep, very technical. Um, and, you know, people have to have a lot of background if they're going to remotely um, grok what I'm saying. And, um, yeah, and the meditation part, yeah. My friend who have uh, meditated for shorter time than I, he actually <laughs> got into this bliss state where he said, well, a tear was rolling down, like uh, with you, you know. Yeah. Um, and I, I haven't experienced that as uh, you have done. I mm. find it very interesting. But the closest I was to that was when I uh, was on. Uh, we had meditated a lot, 
uh, we read together, we meditate together, and then we took LSD because her mind was already into this meditative state. So it only strengthened it so much that we, you could hear all the sound of all the animals, all the bees in the middle of the summer, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was perfectly still, everything, and no, no, nothing in mind. It was just beauty, all. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, that was um, touching on the oneness, you know. You're getting into that vibration of sheer beauty and perfection. Yeah. And uh, when we meditate more and more and more, you experience that more and more. And yeah. that's why I'm always singing songs about, you know, can you see this light and just look at how yeah. those leaves are shimmering. And you, you enter into a different uh, dimension whereby you, you just see the world in a very different way. But for a while, when I meditated more and more and more, it, it became like I uh, didn't get there anymore. You, know? you didn't what? I didn't get uh, as deep anymore because uh, there was a certain, I, I mean, inner suffering in a way, you know, things I uh, um, just deal with inwards, you know, um, but uh, I think it's just a stage, not, not right now, but uh, before when I meditated more, you know. So, uh, but, yeah. did you ever reach a part whereby you just was completely content just to stay there forever? You're in such a beautiful place whereby it's so wonderful that you don't want to open your eyes. You don't think about anything. You don't want to do anything. You don't want to go anywhere. There's nothing there at all. You are in bliss. And you're entirely content. And the only thing that brings you out of that is when your stomach starts rumbling to such an extent or you need to urinate or defecate or whatever, something calls you out of it. Otherwise, you, you'd be perfectly content just to stay there for hours. Have you never been like that? No, not for hours, no. All right. You, you, you know, uh, when I have sat down and meditating uh, in one period, it was weird with my back. It always, I, I forced myself to sit up meditating because it uh, put a lot more uh, pressure on me, you know, wakefulness and that kind of stuff. So my back starts to do like that after a while. Like, so I through the meditation try to push myself up on such a thing you know yeah and i think uh, that that is uh, things i could solve with the mind you know yeah i think the... because i became very meditative afterwards when i pushed through it a lot you know for, for a long time we meditated and uh, then took the lsd afterwards yeah yeah. yeah, all these sort of like, you know, aches and pains and, you know, things that you feel in the body when you, you, you're meditating, you're just sitting. Um, I think they're just teething uh, problems because by the time you've been doing it long enough, um, none of that is an issue anymore. Your body knows what to do. It's found its position where it's comfortable with. And, you know, just you saying that to me now, it's kind of like, wow, it's been so long since I ever had any of those issues. I've never thought about it. Meditation yeah. for me, I close my eyes and within a few seconds, I'm in the abyss. And that's it. I'm just there. You know, every single night I, I turn the, 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 the lights and the computer off um, about midnight um, and I'm sitting in this chair and I just sit back, recline back and I'm just in the beautiful, comfortable position like this. And then an hour, an hour and a half goes by until the body feels completely satiated. And my body's got a time, about 45 minutes or an hour and a half. Um, in one sitting, that tends to be when the body goes, 
that's it. I'm completely recharged. There's no point in me uh, recharging anymore. It's like you put your phone on. Once it says 100%, it's done, you know? Yeah. And, and so that, that's the thing, um, what, what, what it does now. Uh, and yeah. I, I've never, ever had to force myself into a regiment whereby, oh, I've got to meditate because all these wonderful things are supposed to happen. From the first day I started to meditate, I liked it. And I was very excited about doing it again the next day. And then I just thought, fuck, this is so great. And then every time I meditated, uh, I'd open my eyes feeling so wonderful. And I would just instantly have downloads, all different sorts of things. And that's why, you know, I just started to make these videos. I just like, um, and this, yeah. that's 40 yeah. years ago. Yeah, I remember in the past when I meditated, it, it was different back then. It was different back then. Right. Uh, it has changed over the years, you know. But, you know, if you try Kratom... Um, have you, yeah, have you... yeah, I, I try that every now and then, actually. Right, well, what, on Kratom, it's easy to meditate then. Yeah, but but I don't I I'm in, like I don't want to heighten dosage uh, too much and so on, you know. I don't know how, how many grams of kratom do you take? Just, just, just a normal dose, um, because yeah. there's no benefit to taking high doses because you just get tired and you can't keep your eyes open. So you, you just have a beveled teaspoon. Uh, sometimes you can even just, if you're just starting, you can just have a flat teaspoon. So that's only like you know one gram. Um, uh, a beveled teaspoon, uh, quite high, is about three grams because it's very light, it's very fluffy. You never want any more than three grams. No, if three grams is even too much, I would uh, say for oh, me. Yeah, it would uh, be too much for you. So you'd start with one gram or one and a half gram. Yeah. I, I used it for, uh, for a couple of years straight from 2015. Oh, okay. So you, you, know, you know what it's about then. Uh, 17. Then I just abruptly, when I go to another country, I just stop using it, you know? Right. But uh, when I was uh, at my highest, I was at eight grams a day, you know. Eight but, grams uh, a day, yeah. Yeah, but uh, then I took it through the working day. I took in the morning. I took this, this, and that, you know. But um, but uh, I never had any problems going off it either. It was like, yeah, no, I don't do that more. I don't need it. Then I never took it for a year again, you know. Then I tried it again later on. Yeah, uh, I, mean, I mean, we're all different. Some people say they get kind of addicted to it. Um, you know, yeah, I've, just, I've never felt that. No, very little. You, you just taper off. You just reduce the amount you take each day for about exactly, three days. Exactly what I, I do as well, you know. It, it, it's okay to just uh, be on like uh, two or three grams a day. It's yeah. uh, absolutely perfect, you know. Heighten it over five grams, I think the memory becomes uh, a bit uh, wacky. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, what happens with me is I just keep falling asleep all the time. I just feel like meditating, but then I fall asleep. So uh, you, you, there's no benefits to um, uh, taking high doses. You just take um, uh, a small, moderate amount and you, you get the benefits from that. So what, what I think we'll do is, is we'll wrap this up, Andre, in about 10 minutes' mm -hmm. time. That gives us one mm -hmm. hour and 45 minutes. Um, mm -hmm. You know, um, I, I'm stop making these longer videos, you know, because mm -hmm. um, they're, just, they're just too long and they're exhausting. Um, but um, is, is there anything that you want to finish up on for, for the last 10 minutes? Hmm. Yeah, well, we can uh, finish up on... Uh... Uh, like talking about certain books, you know. Yeah. Do you know, uh, know this guy, Miguel Serrano? No. Uh, he was a friend of Carl Jung. Right. He was a friend of Carl Jung and Hermann Hesse. This book, I don't really understand what he's talking about. It's too too symbolic, you know. Right. It's um, but it's very interesting in a way, you know. I understand some things, but he actually 
it uh, talks about uh, um, like it's almost poetic most of uh, things in it he was also a friend of Harman Hesse uh, he talks about Lucifer and stuff as well he has the pictures like that in uh, it as well All the chakras yeah so and uh, here's another book which is also interesting uh, also uh, by Miguel Serrano, it's a friendship with Carl Jung and Hermann Hesse. Right. It's a very beautiful book. Uh, here, uh, here, Hermann Hesse and uh, Miguel Serrano. Oh, what, what's the general theme of that book? Uh, of this book is the friendship of uh, Carl Jung and Hermann Hesse and their hermeneutic uh, relationship together, you know? Right. So they were th three together that... Um, uh, had um, like a kind of uh, yeah went together all three of them you know well that sounds very interesting i think i'd like that book because um it would have been um a wonderful little um uh triune uh three you know brilliant minds together into all that deep stuff there must be a lot of stuff that was come out of that yeah he, he t talks about all kinds of stuff uh, uh, because, uh, you know, um, Hermann Hesse had a very, uh, yeah, I don't know if you read uh, Hermann Hesse's books, no. but it, it, uh, it's very Jungian in a way, but it's like uh, more uh, like uh, novels and so on, you know. Right. But uh, uh, in, in those books, it's often the dualities and so on, you know. And I, I love when they uh, talk about the dualities of things, where you can see two persons within one and so mm -hmm. on. Yeah, well, well everything's a paradox. Just, yeah. That, that, that's for sure. And, and so um, the, the book I'm reading at the moment in time then is that Paramahansa Yogananda, The Second Coming of Christ, which I um, quote a great deal. You, you read it before, but reading it again, right? No, this is a double volume. Ah, okay. This, I is, see. this is this is number two. Ah, okay. The, the, ah, the second. Collectively, one. they're they're one thousand five hundred and fifty pages. So mm -hmm. each volume is like over seven hundred pages, and um, uh, it's superb, absolutely superb. It is the best. Um, um, interpretation assessment of the new testament that i i've ever come upon and i've read a lot uh, but this one you see because he's an indian yogi or he was um steeped in indian mysticism um and philosophy uh, as well as um religions from the east then much more open-minded uh, and can see the, the whole picture. And that's the, the, the thing that's lacking in the Western world with Christianity. They don't realize that all that stuff, you know, came out of paganism and, and, and Eastern philosophy, um, you know, which, which goes back thousands of years. Uh, they don't want to accept that. They just want to think that it's all new. None of it's new. Not a single bit of it's new. It's all forged on, you know, um, the, the ancient belief systems, uh, yeah. mythology and um, ideologies and all that sort of thing. But, um, yeah, I mean, th th this book, I get through, you know, a few pages in a sitting and then I need to make a video or I need to contemplate or I need to, you know, uh, cross-reference or, or something. And... Um, it, it, it's it's really really amazing when you, you you get into a book that every page means something every page stimulates you every yeah. page will give you something and albeit that the, the, it's kind of like he, he is an adherent of the miracles that jesus performed he will tell you reasons why miracles um uh, are not so outlandish because there's there's many things in this 
life and world which are very very peculiar and i like that and then you know he speaks about um you know the the uh, levitation that the indian gurus are said to have been you know able to do also uh, indian gurus making manifest in two places at the same time there's been lots of instances of all that and so then he just relates that to the death of jesus he could do it also and you know that the healing abilities well, mostly that's about Reiki. Once you have a, have a, a good understanding of Reiki, about the healing of the hands, and uh, once uh, you are already considered to be a healer or a shaman or a guru, then uh, the placebo effect is, is going to be, you know, making, you know, the vast majority of people better. So there's, there's a whole lot more that goes into it. And it's not just blind miracles and, you know, all that sort of stuff. And that's why I love this, because it takes me closer to reality um and that's the thing you know it, it gets rid of all the bullshit it explains everything mm. and you know even for instance um he's explaining how did jesus manage to feed five thousand people on two loaves of bread and five fishes right you've heard that one yeah yeah, okay, everyone knows that one. Um, and it's kind of like, how did you feed 5,000 hungry people um, on such a small amount of um, food? Well, he starts to say, well, if you um, can imagine somebody with such a powerful aura and presence um, with abilities to uh, hypnotize people and implant within their minds a level of satiation, he could have said, like, um, we will each take the smallest little crumb of this bread and as soon as you ingest it, it will inflate within your stomach and satiate you. And so you feel like you've had a huge meal. Well, I mean, hypnotists can do this on stage today. And so mm. whether that happened or not, you know, it's just an instantiation. It's a hypothesis that something uh, remotely could be feasible about these things. Yeah. And so I like that about it, you know, because there is lots of um, things that are feasible um, when we look at the placebo effect, when we look at hypnosis, uh, when we look at the effects of propaganda. Um, people believe stuff they've never even seen or heard just because someone said it. And so we know the power of the word. And so if he told everybody that, hey, this is special bread, all you need is one tiny little crumb and then it just fills you up. It's magic. It's sent from the Lord. Well, we know that there's plenty of Christians around today that think Jesus is the real thing. He's up in the sky and he loves them. Um, we know how powerful this stuff is. And so, you know, and then ultimately, when you uh, realize that uh, everything is consciousness, in any case, everything is mind. So there is no physical corporality here in any case. Mm, yeah. You see, when you when you take away the corporality, the corporality is only Maya. It's only illusion. It's an illusion that we've all bought into. Uh, but like I say, when, when our greatest of scientists look for the matter and they can't find it, and then they, you know, look for all these particles and everything, and they say, well, look, we're creating them all out of our consciousness, out of our imagination. Uh, well, aren't we just doing what uh, God did originally in the beginning? He just started thinking about shit and then it manifest. And so when we look philosophically across the whole board, well, of course, anything's possible because it's all mind. Yeah. And then we don't need to consider a man walking on water. If, if this is a, a simulation, if this is a hologram, if this is a dream in the mind of God, anything is possible. Yeah. It, 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 many of those things is like, uh, for, I, I think I'm a bit of a systematizing uh, person. So I see it as uh, systems, you, you know. Um, and uh, I can uh, think that, oh, this is a use, useful system at this uh, point in time. Mm -hmm. So, so a perspective of a God being in a certain way could be a system for me to navigate my life in a way. Yeah, I, th I think if we broaden our consciousness 
and um, we don't have any beliefs. Like, for instance, today, this afternoon, I was in my favorite garden and I was just saying to myself, look, if I incrementally just take away every single thing that I was told and believed to be true, if I just take them away, like René Descartes did, what's left? What's left? This consciousness is awareness. That's all that's left. That's all that's real. Everything else has been fabricated. Everything else has been manifest by our minds and our thoughts. Book, Paramahansa, Yogananda, Jesus, writing, pages, text, ink, white, brown. Take all those things away. What's there? Nothing. So we can see, we can very easily see how our reality just falls apart, right? Yeah. So when we are, when we bear that in mind, we realize that, you know, all these things that people wrote about and considered to be true, Jesus walking on water and all the rest of it. Well, I mean, burning bushes and this and the other. I saw God or a robed, bearded bloke up in the, the clouds. I saw angels. I saw demonic type things like that. I've seen a lot of stuff. And the things I've seen um, on DMT and just breathing, uh, my mind, my consciousness has changed, yeah. are equal to anything I've read in the Bible. Yeah. So... You know, they all, we knew they had entheogens then. We knew that, you know, through exhaustion, uh, this, that, and the other, our consciousness sees apparitions and, you know, all different sorts of things. Yeah. Mm. That's how we got to look at the world, I think. We don't take any of it too serious. We don't take anything too literal because literally there is nothing here. Mm. 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 So on that note, then, I suppose we'll wrap it up, 1 hour and 45. Uh, it's a reasonable time. And, um, yeah, you know, just, um, you know, give me a shout when you, you, you're a few more chapters through. And yeah, uh, yeah. now you know how I'm going to grill you about it. Um, you might underline a few more things. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. You know, every time we talk, you see that I'm – in one way, uh, a certain point in time, and at another point in time, I'm like this and that, you know. Might, might be a little more like off the topic this time, you know, every now and then. Off the topic? Uh, yeah. Uh, sometimes we did, uh, like I came uh, to talk about something else um, just within the certain topic which is yeah. maybe not the best thing all the time to stay online instead uh, you know yeah. uh, I, I just uh, did that recognition about myself here you know because mm. it, like uh, i thought like that you know yeah and when we have these conversations you know we, we interact and we um grow and f feed each other um and you know there's something to be learned um, from anybody that listens to us. And there's something to be learned from both of us engaging with each other, different perspectives. You know, I've learned things from, from your perspective today, which I found really interesting. I thought, okay, yeah, that, that's cool. You know, um, you know, I, I, I love to listen to things that are going to stimulate me the same as you do. And so, yeah, yeah it's really cool. And so, um, yeah, okay, mate. So um, I'll see you next time. Yeah, see you next time. Have a good one. You too. Thank you. <laughs> see you later, bro. See you. Bye.